Thank you, Guy, for the opportunity. Can you hear me okay? Beautiful. Uh, there is an expectation that <clears throat> the attendees have had a chance to read the paper or will read it at some point. So I, I'd prefer not to read the paper or, or to uh, summarize it in great detail. Thank you for those of you who stayed for the talk. I realized the lunch hour is approaching fast. And in order to keep things interesting, uh, Steiner and I were throwing around some ideas about the best way to present the material. One idea was to present an interpretive drum uh, drumming session instead of speaking. And so I've got the Bill Bruford's drum pads uh, of behind me. But, but we might save that for another time. Anyway, web novels. This project comes out of, uh, on the back of two other ARC discovery projects, one of which started with Digital China, where we're trying to map uh, in 2014 to 17, tried to map some of the digital transfer transformations in China. And then the second one on the piggyback of that was Webtoons, digital comics, web comics, uh, coming out of Asia as a very particular vertical format. And whilst researching both of those topics, I discovered web novels and a huge spectrum of, of styles, aesthetics, narrative formats, platforms, and transmedia adaptations, and international collaborations, and also some nice regimes of fandom and fan examples, not only translating uh, foreign language, Asian language, web novels for English and other languages, but also voting, rating, promoting, influencing. So this thing, this project, this material I'm sharing with you today is very much about the next uh, discovery project and perhaps even a, a linkage. Um, in case you don't know, uh, maybe some of you read web novels, maybe you don't. There is a huge spectrum of interactivity uh, going from one end of the uh, spectrum of non, uh, of just 100% text in a flip page format and the other extreme is is all image based narrative format or narrative style and and more of a gamification of of the narrative and and in between you have some really wonderful different varieties and examples uh, hooked is an interesting app where people tap on the text in order to advance the narrative so i i sort of see this element of eavesdropping and the excitement of, of reading other people's chats between each other and the voyeur, the, the viewer, the voyeur is, is digesting the narrative, digesting the drama. So I, I find that to be really fascinating and it really opens up storytelling. And what makes it more interesting in this larger digital and mobile domain is the transmedia adaptation the feature films, the TV series, even the web tunes and even web series that are being inspired by and adapted from web novels. So I could talk uh, for a long time about generalities. Um, My Sassy Girl from 2001, that Korean, South Korean feature film is a really interesting example. That, that starts off as an internet novel uh, and that particular format was a blog, a, a weekly blog, where the author was describing his, the trials and tribulations of a relationship he was experiencing. And it gained, it gained a following. The regularization of the uploading of the blog content made it seem like it was a novel. And so it became part of the, it, it adopted, it, it received a label, uh, the internet novel label. And uh, then it was made into a fiction uh, novel, published, and then it became a, a very famous and successful uh, feature film in 2001, which helped launch, uh, well, contributed strongly to the Korean wave, right? So I thought, what, what's going on here? How can we trace some of these opportunities and challenges 
and, and how is this ecosystem forming and evolving? These are all questions that I'm interested in exploring. Uh, and so there's four major or five major areas to the project, looking at aesthetics, the form, looking at the innovation, the tech, the platforms, looking at the transmedia adaptation potential and, and lived, you know, the success failures and the international collaborations of those adaptations across, you know, sort of transnational adaptation, transnational collaboration, and also the fan, fan reactions, fan contributions, and that intermediation I find to be really fascinating where very uh, loyal fans become influencers or do the heavy lifting for promoting the so-called web novels, uh, not only through their comments, but, but votes, et cetera. And in terms of the theoretical context, there's sort of five major theoretical areas that I'm trying to tease out and connect to the content. You've got a kind of a go-to in media industries, which is value. It's become a go-to. What value do the web novels bring to audiences, directors, producers, consumers of the media, the industry locally, globally? Um, the intermediation that I mentioned by fans and readers. Uh, also cultural globalization. What influence is this content and what influence are these platforms having uh, as they come out of Asia, primarily, and uh, as, a, as a strong digital media format. How are they being uh, adopted and, and engaged with uh, by non-Asian audiences? And, and of course, connected to that is the notion of soft power, the charismatic appeal of, of this content and, um, and so forth. Finally, trying to revisit this notion of Asianization of media, where, where West, the West is replaced, the strong Western contenders, the strong Western dominating producers of media are replaced with Asian uh, creators, developers, et cetera. That's the project in a very general nutshell. And in order to get some of the more nuanced uh, flavor of the work, I thought it'd be a good opportunity to ask Steiner to do a little Q and A with me rather than a drum solo. Although we'd still like to do that for you at a, at a later date. Uh, Steiner, you're, you're here, right? You wanna fire away with some of your questions? Yeah, I'll uh, save my, the drum solo I'd prepared for later. Um, look, I think this is, uh, it's, it's really interesting uh, research. And uh, I think one of the things that, that's probably, um, that puts people off a bit, I think when they hear about uh, this particular, you know, digital kind of uh, industries, is anything with the word web in front of it sounds like it has lesser value. Take it, you know, as someone who's looking at web series, um, you know, that's something that, that we've been met with a lot. But then you start showing the numbers, right? And, and you see that this is, this is uh, significant industries. And it's one of the things that you picked up in, in your, you know, that you lay out in the paper as well. And that in China alone, it's a, it's a, it's a multi-billion dollar industry with um, more than 300 million people in China engaging with this particular format. So the, size, the sheer size of this industry, of course, China alone is a big market, but the sheer size of these industries, I think are just, constantly underestimated in in the in the grand scheme of things so which is why you know the 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 research that that you're doing here is of, of great importance to highlight the contribution that these sort of areas actually do make to uh to not just the creative economy but the creative but the economy overall um 
So, but but I guess I'd I'd just start with something I think is very very simple. Now I was going to ask you why people should care about this, but I guess I'd I introduced that point by <laughs> myself. But what kind of defines the web novel? Is it is it the mode of delivery? Is it is it the interactivity offered by the medium? Uh, in such a way that it is, you know, a novel or a graphic novel um, available on the internet? Or are there particular kind of features about it, I, I guess, that makes it its own in a, in a literary or a, or a medium sort of sense? That's a great question. <clears throat> and I think uh, the definition of web novel probably is similar to how web series is defined. There's quite a variety of voices and definitions when it comes to the format. In Australia, as you know, I shouldn't even go there, but in the web series is considered to be a fairly relatively low budget, but not low as in uh, maxing out your credit card, although that's probably part of it. Low in terms of compared to big Hollywood productions, right? Uh, and in South Korea, the web series is is considered to be more of a professional uh, higher budget although labor is cheaper over there so in, in the end it, it's not so much higher of a budget but but professional slick serialized content that's ott over the top on streaming platforms in china uh professional uh web series on on streaming platforms such as netflix are called web series similarly with web novels, you get a, like I said, there is a, a huge variety going from 100% page turning text uh, that's featured on platforms in small bite sized chunks. So it's definitely chapter and chunk oriented. It's chunked uh, to be released weekly, sometimes a couple times a week. So you have a release pattern that's critical to that definition of web novel. You also have uh, some platforms allow user engagement, allow users, registered users to post comments and to rank their stories and to vote. Um, and so the, the level of interactivity differs between web novel platforms. And then the does format- that, can, I, can I interject yeah. with a question on there? Does that- does that uh, the the level of interactivity does does is that dictated by the professionality of the content fair question different platforms specialize in different formats so you've got hooked which is more along the lines of that eavesdropping on a conversation uh, a relationship breaking down or maybe starting up or maybe a crime being committed so you've got these genre oriented texts, but on a platform such as Hooked, the user taps the screen to advance the texts being exchanged between the main protagonists. Uh, so it's the format that's dictated on particular apps, niche apps. Uh, Chidian in, in China is more of a traditional text-based uh, chapter, uh, page flipping uh, environment. But Moonpia and Kakao Page in South Korea have uh, have picked up a variety of formats and a variety of genres, uh, a couple of dozen different genres, with fantasy and drama being among the most popular uh, web novel genres, at least in South Korea. Mm. Does that answer your question? That answers it it brilliantly. Um. So I'll uh, pick up on a, can I, I was going to pick up on a question that Sue's posting here. You mentioned in your paper that, that you know, this is like a perfect, like the web novels in, 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 the, in the Chinese, the Korean environments are sort of epitomizes this idea of the creator economy, um, which is, you know, that's, the creator economy can, can be, um, a utopian vision, but it can also be what underpins the gig economy, right? <laughs> so it, it, it's kind of like it can be whatever, uh, it, can, it can be a promise or it can be a, be a life sentence in a, 
in a way. So with this proliferation and people's ability to kind of post, make stuff and share it with a, with a, with a mass audience, how does this sort of work in the, in the web novel space? Is it, you know, if you get engagement and numbers, the traditional media vultures who are circling the, <laughs> circling the field will, might come in and, and chew up some of your content and, 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 and throw you a dollar in the process. How, is that the way that these things get monetized? I'm glad you mentioned the M word because it's all about monetization and it's also about a dream, aspirations. Um, and again, that's not a singular thing or a singular desire or experience. You've got some people posting because they want to share. They don't care about getting any feedback or monetar monetarily feedback or, or even audience feedback. Other people are, are there to grow what we might consider IP, intellectual property, which is very similar to what we see in the web tune industry. People using the format uh, and part of the dream is to get discovered, get your IP discovered. Not so much uh, get discovered as an individual, although that helps to build long-term following and something that you can then, you monetize yourself um, on, on Kickstarter or Patreon, where people are, are like other fields, are, are donating money because they love you as a creator, content creator. Um, so monetization, is handled differently on different platforms. There's definitely a dark side to the industry in terms of exploitation, labor exploitation. Um, but I, I think generally there is this desire, this dream to A, share content, B, get discovered, and C, have your work uh, be picked up by, by uh, made into a feature film uh, but but it's all it's all kinds of dreams and all kinds of there isn't a single content creator's dream there. To, uh, I don't know if that answers your question or not. But um. no, it, it it does. It's very as you sort of draw upon, I suppose, in in your paper as well. The it it fits within this sort of framework of social media entertainment and uh, reasonably well, and. I guess one of the things that, that would be interesting to uh, to talk to there as well then is how how do these things translate from a Chinese market to the world from a Korean market to the world like the the movie that you mentioned my sassy girl is is uh, is a you know famous movie i suppose um, in a, in, a, in a career to the West sort of uh, sort of sense, still not um, a box office kind of hit in the in the West, to my knowledge. But what were there other IPs or other things developed in that process? How did these things translate? How did they grow internationally? Huge question. Um, <clears throat> triple barrels, even. Look, apologize. Um, Obviously, there's some wonderful accidents, and uh, it's really hard to predict or to establish a specific model for success. Uh, My Sassy Girl was, an unex I'd argue, an unexpected success. Um, I don't think you could have made a Pan-Asian success story uh, at that time. You couldn't have set out to do it. Uh, and so that's it's wonderful accidental success. But in terms of the traveling how this stuff travels in the case of my sassy girl it it was that blog that that weekly or bi-weekly blog where the author released and and people bought into it they enjoyed reading about his trials and tribulations with romance and then he got picked up invited to by a publisher to publish it then the feature film feature film accidentally attracts it becomes a pan-asian success and it's made into a TV series at home, but it's also made in 2008, uh, seven years after the film is released in a, as a TV series in Japan. Same year, it's, it's a remake film in the US. And uh, eight years after that, it's remade as a Chinese Korean co-production, feature film co-production in 2016. So along the way, the original source material 
is traveling, obviously, but it's connecting with different audiences with the same essential story, the same essential genre conventions, the same tension between the characters, the same elements of surprise, which apparently translates very well in Asia, but, but the US remake from 08 didn't really connect with its Western audiences. So again, I don't know if that answers your question, but it's, it's, no, it it's unpredictable. Um, and there are, I like the, the, the imagery you, you used a little while ago about the industry vultures circling around looking for hot property to exploit in transmedia adaptation. And I, I think there's a lot of people, I, I, I agree with that, that image. I agree with that. Okay, Sorry, so we might just open it up to other questions because there's quite a few other questions in the chat. I think Sue's question's probably been addressed by you, Brian. Um, Kath had a question as well. Um, do you want to speak to that, Kath, or can I just read it out for you? Uh, Brian can see it there, I guess, himself. I can try to see it. So Kath's asking, how did it come to be called a novel and not story? Is there a time component, like the difference between short story and novel and fiction? There's a moment where it does pick up a brand. It becomes a web novel and one of the, the massive Chinese platform that Steiner mentioned that in my paper, um, you've got, that's owned by Tencent now. Some of you may know Tencent's the giant media and all things conglomerate in China. And uh, they, they were able to get in early and get the web novel, webnovels.com URL. So it's definitely something that has been branded and there's a particular moment when that, that starts to be recognized and identified. Um, I think you can call it many things, uh, but in terms of the digital ecosystem, the digital economy, we're now starting to see categories on platforms such as Kakao Page in South Korea that's got web series column or web series corner. It's got web novel corner. It's got web tune corner. So these are very strong categories of digital media content that, that are sticking for the moment. Um, yeah, and Lucas had a question as well. Did you want to speak to that, Lucas? Yeah, I guess, um, yeah. yeah, my question comes from ignorance. So forgive me because I'm not a, um, someone who's engaged with web novels knowingly, although maybe you'll tell me that I have without even knowing that what they're called. Um, I'm just wondering like to what extent, like uh, uh, my understanding of a traditional novel might be that you could read it in paperback, you could read it in hardback, you'd read it on your Kindle, but what we refer to as the novel is kind of like uh, exists separate from that particular delivery system and is able to be migrated across them without, um, you know, loss of uh, resolution or integrity of the, the thing that we kind of think of as the work. And I'm just wondering whether that kind of concept of the difference between the content and the delivery system, is that broken down in the web novel world? Well, what I can say is that <clears throat> each platform dictates certain guidelines for the particular content they want to feature. So if it's a tap novel, if it's a tap oriented web novel, then there are certain character sizes you need to, to achieve and present. There are certain lengths and certain colors. They're, they're, each platform would dictate a particular guide for uploaders. There's not a, as far as I know, and I did a quick cursory count and found at least 94 platforms in this area across North America and Asia. And uh, they all have different guidelines. Um, do they, do they most, oh, sorry, I'm just jumping in. Do they have mostly North American content or do they also have say Chinese and Korean uh, uh, web novels that's been translated? What they have are, are their, their core language. So if their core language is English, then anybody providing content in English, whether no matter where they're from, uh, qualifies to be on that, hosted on that site. But, but I just wanted to finish by saying, 
I didn't find any of those 94 platforms, Lucas, um, that, that were like wild, that, that let you just put up any format that you wanted. They, were, they like to keep somewhat uh, format guides and format restrictions. Um, and you just, content creators have to find a platform that suits the format that they wanna use. So if you want a tap novel, and write a tap novel and produce a tap novel, you go to, you go to uh, Hooked. If you want more of a traditional, uh, predominantly text-based experience or, or, or text, you, you put that on, on web novels, the Chinese uh, web novels platform. Brian, can I just ask, is there, you know, when you go to um, Kindle, it'll often now give you a time-based experience if you're looking at a novel it's going to take you five hours or ten hours or so is this distinction about it being a novel as opposed to like a short experience of some other kind is that time is that an expected length you know so that there's it's more significant than just a you know a short um 20 sentence story well let me say, thanks for that question. Uh, I like Neil Stevenson. I'm a fan of his and I recently read something of his on Kindle and it was like, it took seven minutes to finish. But I didn't realize that at the time. So um, maybe I should have. To answer your question, uh, again, the S word, spectrum. There, there are so many different kinds of formats and, and thus experiences for the reader. Some are very short bursts, short form, um, micro stories, you might, you might call them. Others are serialized, chapter-oriented um, uh, stories that have, that have seasons. You've got season one or, or book or volume one that, that continue. You, you have such a variety of, of formats and styles. That's the beauty. Part, part of the beauty of, of the ecosystem, enabling amateur and semi-intermediate and professional content creators to upload a style, a format that, they, that they're interested in. Um, and again, you have to find a platform that, that fits the right, what, what you're into. Uh, and I think after, it, it doesn't take very long for the reader to understand what they're getting into. I don't think there'll be a surprise. Uh, oh, I didn't know this was a seven minute uh, book uh, because all, usually the comments from readers and viewers also reveal uh, some of the uh, styles and formats. So you can read up on a web novel before you, just like any, any book, uh, before you engage it. Would any be, you know, like a five hour length or are we just talking, do you know what I mean? You've most, mostly mentioned. How slow of a reader are you? I mean, when you say five hours, I mean, we're talking about, um, sure. Sure, you've got some, some uh, seven volume, 10 volume web novels, text-based that are more flip chapter or scroll style that, that'll keep you occupied uh for more than five hours i mean maybe five months especially through a, a release strategy and getting notifications that the latest chapter has been uploaded and uh, another fascinating thing about this ecosystem is if a platform allows it the author can engage directly with the readership in a way where if an author wants to the author can change the narrative of future chapters, of future weekly releases or monthly releases, uh, monthly sections to suit reader desires and, and comments. Uh, that's a bit of a pain in the ass, I'm sure, for, for, for a producer, content creator, to, to, to change things on the whim of, a, of your readership. But it offers a level of engagement that we don't see in other traditional, uh, certainly not in the Kindle arena. This is very much a, a opposed opposition to, to the Kindle world, which is more of a lockdown. Web novels, if, if I can make a one concluding point, 
web novels are more of a, an open uh, environment, an open format, in the sense that it's not locked down like a Kindle text or a Kindle environment is. Um, so sorry, Sue, so, uh, Karen had a question. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah. And then I think Coralie had her hand up as well. So Karen just had a question. Sorry, yeah. Do you want to speak to that quickly, Karen? What I'm really interested in is how do, does the audience and the writer find each other? How do you, if, it, if it's a huge platform, how do people make distinctions between different kinds of categories and different kinds of styles and genres? And like, are there things like online, um, discussion groups or that where people might subscribe and find out recommendations. How, do, how, do, how does it work? How do people find well, each other? It works in many ways, like you just said. There are, are communities that form around platforms, yeah. that form around authors, that yeah. form around stories. Uh, and so there's also subscription notifications built into some of the platforms. When a new chapter is uploaded, weekly or bi-weekly you're notified um so yeah there there are a lot of different ways to connect and to maintain to, to be part of a, that community and i think it's a great word actually that the fact that you have a community around the text around the author uh i find to be quite fascinating and and i find it to be missing mm -hmm. like in the closed environment of of the kindle for example uh, although if you're a neil gaiman fan and you're reading Neil Gaiman on Kindle, you can certainly find Neil Gaiman and uh, other, other uh, like-minded readers elsewhere, like on Facebook or whatever. Um, yeah, that's a great question. And uh, community is, is a big part of some of the platform environments. Is it mutual? Do people end up writing responses to things that they've read that then become part of it? Yeah. Some of the platforms that are more, um, experimental and for the authors that that are deeply interested in connecting and maintaining connections with their fans it, it's up to the author yeah. up to the content creator there's a lot of abuse sometimes a lot of trolling that occurs in in this open environment so some of the authors choose not to you know some some authors would would never allow readers to post comments hmm. uh, whereas others who have a more positive experience, love it. Mm. And um, writing in response to people then kind of go, oh, I'm going to write something in the style of in response to these characters or this. We see that in the webtoon environment, but and I and I think it exists in the web novel environment. I can't speak from a specific example. Um, it's a lot of work to pivot, as you mm. might appreciate, it, and and Kath would know for sure. It's it's really tough to pivot on audience whim. Mm. Uh, but it can certainly, the format uh, definitely um, has space for that, for those pivots. Mm. Uh, so I think Coralie, you had your hand up a while back, so thanks for your patience. Um, no worries. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you, Brian. This is fascinating stuff. Um, it seems to me that you're, you're um, surfing the crest of a cultural phenomenon. Uh, which is leaving um, my generation behind. Um, I, I see it as a really millennial, um, you know, phenomenon. Uh, but I'm interested in the precedent that has, you know, that has, is driving this. I'm, I'm sort of interested in, uh, you know, the notion of manga and cosplay and K-pop and how they're sort of becoming rising phenomenons in the millennial um, zeitgeist i suppose um and so how the, the and, and the fan driven stuff that sort of has its um has its roots in 1980s choose your own adventure novels and things like that so there's more agency of the consumer in this product um which i find fascinating and the whole internet has enabled this but my, my question is uh, around around the uh, your concept of um the um, what did you call it? The Asianization? Is that what you called it? Um, and the commercial opportunities that this perhaps uh, presents in sort of mimicking this style or making this a, um, a, a transnational style, would it work? 
you know, um, is it is it a because of this president? Is it a particular style? Is it a particular aesthetic that will suffer in translation? It's a bit like um, the American adaptations of Nordic noir. They just go, you know. Um, so, is it necessarily an opportunity for uh, commercial production in, say, Australia? Would it fall flat? Do you think? Well, that's a good question. It, it... The part of the Asianization story and theory is that there is the replacement of this dominant in industry force, replacing Western dominant media players with, with new Asian players. Uh, but also, um, there is, there is the, at the same time, there is a kind of erasure of Asian styles, Asian culture, in some points of this. In order to be global, uh, it has to appeal to a variety of cultures simultaneously. Not an easy feat to, to pull off. Uh, and so that fits in with some of your, your, your thoughts on the limited opportunities for that to occur outside of Asia. Asianization does uh, show itself most strongly in Asia, where where more non-Western, non-Hollywood choices are available, more Asian media choices, more Asian content choices are available to a, across Asia for Asian uh, consumers. So there's that part of, of the theory that, and, and phenomenon that's, that we're seeing. But do, don't you think it's a it's a it's a um, two way street really? I mean, uh, some of the uh, Asian things that we have access to in the mainstream, like uh, you know the Chinese dating shows and all that, there's such a Western uh, influence on the Chinese culture there. Um, and and when you think about K-pop, there's the boy bands sort of in, infiltrating all of that. So it's like a regurgitation of uh, Western stuff with the Asian sort of flavor to it. So I'm wondering whether that's a, an, a, an homogenization, a global globalization. Maybe we're not really putting things in sort of boxes. No, it's very interesting, right? So, and, and thank you for bringing that wider sort of cultural phenomenon into the picture, K-pop and, uh, and the Chinese dating shows. Of course, there is no US or Western dating show that has that many contestants other in a studio setting yes. so, so the scale is quite different for yeah. uh, you are the one yeah. but but the point is that there's more non western choice of contents and some of it embraces asian sensibility right uh, you know we have to look at a case by case some of it embraces asian tradition Mm -hmm. views toward marriage, views toward family, views toward death, mm -hmm. views toward ghosts. Uh, and some of it erases all of that. The mm -hmm. point is, is that webnovels.com comes out of China. It's massive platform. Uh, yep. Line Webtoon, go, going back to digital comics, for example, comes out of South Korea. It's the biggest web, digital comics, web comics platform of its kind around the world. So you, you, you have these new players. Mm. from an industry perspective, right. part of the Asianization phenomenon. Right, got you. So, but thank you for the comments, awesome. Oh, it's fascinating stuff. <laughs> Sue, Sue, did you have a comment that... Um... Oh, look, we, we, I can see we're just about out of time, but, um, and I think Guy was agreeing with me, and I think Kath was as well, that when you were talking about that serial release of the narrative chapter by chapter, I immediately went, oh, Dickens. You know, the, the old is the new is old again in that sense of, of um, you know, and Dickens changing his plot lines as various things, be, you know, as his audience reacted and he got feedback of one sort or another. Definitely not online, but he got feedback. So I think we're, we're witnessing something, you know, a massive escalation. But when I'm looking at the history of kind of the media and audiences, it, it's I keep saying and I that really the content does not change the formats the, the platforms change the modes of delivery change but we're not changing as human beings that much no i would agree with that john did you want to jump in there just, just in our last minute so I'll just, yeah that's that's what i was i was simply, I was simply going to say that 
is it? Did you see it, uh, Brian, as as evolutionary or or disruptive? And then I, you know, I get Sue's contribution, and I go, I might just back back and shut up because it sounds like it sounds like it could be just a bit of both. Well, I mean, it's disruptive in the sense that uh, the increasing popularity it's achieving, uh, witnessing it's uh, it's the new players in in a in a formerly Western dominant kind of paradigm it's it's content it's amateur content enabling which is pretty wild uh chaotic it's it's a lot of those things and it's also the international collaboration potential and it's the transmedia adaptation experiments hard to get it right really hard for a web comic or a web series or a web tune to build a, an audience and sustain that audience across various media. What works for a published book may not work for an animated, uh, an animation, an animated adaptation of that book or a feature film of that book or a TV series of that book. Um, so it's a risky business, which I hope this project will, will shed some light on. So it is disruptive. Disruptive is a great word, Sean, the D word. Thank you, Sean. I look forward to continuing the conversation at any time. And, and this is the, the fifth ARC grant project uh, in progress. So if anybody would love some ARC grant advice, uh, I'd be more than happy to share some experiences or lend an eye or an ear. So thank right. you for, for listening, everybody. Thank you, Brian. Excellent. Yeah. So um, can we just thank, uh, you, thank all our presenters and um, respondents as well? Um, for a like really kind of um, energetic session, I think. Yeah. So thank you everyone. Um, yeah. And uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Just, just before yes. we go, Guy, we, yes, we, yes. Need, we need a round of applause for Sean, who I believe submitted his PhD this oh, week. Oh, right. Okay. Hey. Congratulations, Sean. <laughs> Up before time. Yeah. What a, what a time to um, submit as well. <laughs> We won't, we won't, we'll save the corks until it's returned. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, yeah. Thanks, guys. Cheers. Thanks. Okay. Sir. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. See you.